Hi, I'm Mitch, and welcome to our 10th of 12 Words to the Wise here at the Cruz Museum in Auburn, Indiana, where I'm surrounded by race cars, and we're going to talk about a race car story. Several years ago, I was asked by some former customers of mine and some friends of mine to come to Boca Raton, Florida, where an airplane hangar would be transformed into a banquet hall, and uh, I would do the invocation and do a charity auction for the Boca Raton Community Hospital and hopefully raise $50,000. Well, the night was an unbelievable gala. And the person who was going to help me with the auction was also going to donate a couple items to the auction. And that was race car uh, cup series winner, Rusty Wallace. I uh, got up to start the auction and Rusty Wallace is with me and he's donating one of his racing suits. And he tells everybody on the microphone uh, with me on the stage, he, he said, Mitchell, the, the most ones ever sold for is $18,500, so you got your work cut out for you tonight, my racing suit for $18,500. And I said, ladies and gentlemen, who'll give $18,500 just to start? I got it right here on the lady, $20,000, $20,000, 19, 19, 5, 20, $20,500, 21000 are you bidding? Twenty-one five. anybody else? A new world's record for Rusty Wallace's racing suit. Twenty-one five sold to the lady. Twenty-one thousand dollars. Give her a round of applause. And what a great night! And it led to other people donating other things. I think two guys donated a jet ride. Um, Rusty Wallace's team owner donated a ride on his yacht and stay on it, and then be an honorary pit crew chief at his uh, at the Daytona Beach race. It was just an unbelievable night. And what they had hoped would total was $50,000 raised, $250,000, all for a great cause. Well, later that night, I'm, uh, the event's over, and I'm walking out with uh, my friend and former uh, customer who brought me down. And we walk up, and we notice that a lady's approaching us. And this lady is probably close to 90 years old. And she looks at me, and she has this checkered flag in her hand that they gave out that night to all who attended. And she said, she looks at me and says, Rusty, will you sign my flag? And the guy I, I was with said, this isn't Rusty Wallace. This is Mitch Cruz. He's, he's the famous classic car auctioneer. And she looked at me and said, I bought a car at one of your auctions. I said, what was it? She said, a Jaguar. I said, well, do you still want me to sign your flag? <laughs> and she said, yes, I do. I love the car. And I said, do you want me to sign it as Rusty or Mitch? <laughs> and she told me to sign it uh, uh, as Mitch. And as I'm t I take about eight or 10 steps further after we walk away from the lady, and I see a man with the thickest glasses I've ever seen in my life, uh, thickest eyeglasses I've ever seen in my life. And he's obviously with the lady, probably her husband, also well into the years, probably 90 years old, and he's probably the one who sent her up to me to get uh, Rusty Wallace's autograph, thinking I was Rusty Wallace. Well, as I'm, I'm walking out, the, the elderly man with his thick glasses looks up at me and says, see you later, Rusty. Now, you see what happened there? Because I was seen with Rusty Wallace, because that night I did life with Rusty Wallace, People thought I was Rusty Wallace. When we're seen with Christ, when we do life with Christ, people see Christ. And today, our 10th word of 12 words to the wise is discipline. Discipline and disciple come from the same root word in Hebrew, meaning learner. Let's turn in our Bibles to Proverbs 12, verse 1, and see what it says about discipline, muskar in Hebrew. Whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but whoever hates correction is stupid. I'm here at the Cruz Museum in Auburn, Indiana, surrounded by a group of fantastic Indy race cars. And what we're going to do here today is we're going to see, we want to make four turns, four turns around the track of discipline. And if we skip just one of them, we're going to experience relational wreckage. 
Uh, the first car uh, beside me is the 1997 Indianapolis 500 winner from the Treadway Racing Team driven by Ari Leyendijk and one of the most exciting finishes in the history of the Indianapolis 500. The second car which made the finish so unique is it's the first time in history that a racing team finished first and second at the Indianapolis 500. Scott Goodyear piloted this Treadway Racing Vehicle to second place and one of the most exciting finishes ever at the Indianapolis 500. If we go down the row, uh, we have two cars that are historical uh, in terms of the Indianapolis 500, and they were driven by one of my best friends of all time, Scott Brayton. And these are the two cars that Scott drove to back-to-back -to -back pole positions at the Indianapolis 500. Again, discipline. We're going to look at four turns around the track of discipline. Miss just one of them, and we're going to experience relational wreckage in our conflict. So we're going to look at the four contextual uses of discipline in Proverbs and see what these four turns of discipline really are and how we apply them to our lives. And the first turn is teach. Teach. And teach is, I do, you watch. Let's turn to Proverbs. Proverbs 16.20 says, Whoever gives heed to instruction prospers, and blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord. Teach. Discipline is instructed to be passed along. Teach. I do, you watch. It's kind of like an apprenticeship. My dad taught me how to auctioneer. That's how I began to experience the I do, you watch at auctions, where my dad wouldn't let me watch cartoons on a Saturday morning, but he made me go to auctions, and I would work, and I would watch, and I would listen, and I could hear him auctioning 24-7. Uh, Even as I would leave the auction, I could hear his voice, and it was something uh, later on that I would mimic as I would learn to actually auctioneer. It's interesting that my dad was practicing discipline. Teach. I do, you watch. Listen to Proverbs 1.8. Listen, my son, to your father's instruction, and do not forsake your mother's teaching. It's really a big deal as parents to teach our kids because they're sponges and they learn all the time. Right away, they're soaking everything in. So it's very important that we remember the teaching that I do, you watch, turn one, because it's been said that what we do in moderation, they'll do in excess. It's been said that values are more caught than taught. And so it's really important that we take the initiative with our kids to teach, to do the I do, you watch, and they get that first turn of discipline. And as you can imagine, this is so important in athletics as well, if you're a coach, that you do all four turns. Because I've noticed, and you're going to see, that some people like to skip turns, and it has a negative effect on their audience. So turn one, teach. I do, you watch. Turn two is train. I do, you help. It's like an apprenticeship. Let's turn our Bible to Proverbs 29, 19. Proverbs 29, 19 reads, Servants cannot be corrected by mere words. Though they understand, they will not respond. Servants aren't going to be corrected by mere words. Though they understand, they will not respond. Let's look at it this way. Players cannot be corrected by mere words. Though they understand, they will not respond. Children cannot be corrected by mere words. Though they understand, they will not respond. Employees cannot be corrected by mere words. Though they understand, they will not respond. There has to be training. There has to be tools given to help people be successful. There has to be natural consequences. There has to be um, benefits of the behavior that you want to reward. We're going to talk about that more later. But it's very important that we not only teach but we train, so we teach the skill set, and then we train the skill set. We have a drill when we're coaching to dial in and train that skill set. Proverbs chapter 6, verses 20 to 23. Let's pick it up in verse 20. My son, keep your father's command and do not forsake your mother's teaching. Bind them always on your heart, fasten them around your neck. When you walk, they will guide you. When you sleep, they will watch over you. When you awake, they will speak to you. For this command is a lamp, this teaching is a light, and correction is the, and instruction are the way to life. 
train a child in the way he should go. There's a unique training, a unique personality. I mean, I have four daughters and each one is totally unique. And it takes a different type of training for each one to train them in the way that they should go. I do, you help. Train them in the way that they should go. So we don't just teach, but we train. We equip them with tools to be successful. I start talking at a very early age with my girls about career paths, about what they're passionate about, what skills they want to develop, what they'd like to get better at, what processes they enjoy. And so I've been discussing this with uh, my third daughter, uh, Lily, about uh, what she's interested in. We've been doing this for a couple years, and she's uh, 13 now. And we can see that she's passionate about art, design, um, she loves people, she loves to get along with people, and right now she also loves athletics, um, and she's, she loves her friends. So we're talking about interior design, we're talking about architecture, we're talking about an artist, we've talked about an art teacher. And so Lily goes through life with those uh, ideas in her mind of potential careers. And so wherever we travel, whatever we do, we're talking about that, and she's already training for what she might want to do in her life. She doesn't have to have it all figured out. She doesn't have it dialed in in just one of those, but she knows the general field. And so it helps us. Like if she wants to play volleyball in college, she's going to want to go to a college where she can pursue the training of those gifts. I think back when I was carrying those clerk sheets uh, at auctions where my grandfather, my dad, and his brothers were auctioning, and I can still hear it. I can still see it in my mind. Well, I remember uh, one particular Saturday standing there with my grandfather, and I said, you know what, it's kind of interesting. You're paying me a dollar a day to carry clerk sheets. And I said, but some days I carry three clerk sheets, and other days I might carry 40 or 50. It doesn't seem to me, this is a five-year-old talking, that it should be the same amount. And Grandpa Russell cleared his throat and he goes, <clears throat> Mitchell, you don't, you don't uh, have to work for less on those days you only carry a few clerk sheets, you'll still get your dollar a day. And I said, you know, I think there needs to be incentive. How about I get paid 10 cents a clerk sheet? Grandpa Russell goes, hmm, wow. You're driving a pretty hard bargain. I, I, I think I might do the 10 cents a clerk sheet. And I said, and I stuck my hand out and I said, with a minimum of a dollar a day, because I'm not going backwards. <laughs> And Grandpa Russell shook my hand and he agreed to the 10 cents per clerk sheet to offer an incentive at a dollar a day minimum. And I realized looking back that I was being trained how to negotiate and how to sell and I didn't even know it. And it was all because my dad got me up early on Saturday mornings, did let me watch cartoons and he decided not just to teach me but to train me and do I do you help. I actually work with my family in their family business. And I think that's important in your business. Uh, you know, you have to make a choice. Is your family going to be part of it? But whoever you have in your business and your team, you can't just teach like turn one. You have to train like turn two. Uh, tr the same way we train our children is the same way that we need to train our employees. We need to train our players if we're coaches, uh, train our teams. And that makes a big difference in the result that we see. In fact, I remember a long time ago, Tony Holman, who owned the Indianapolis 500 Motor Speedway, asked Grandpa Russell, how are you able to have your sons work with you in your family business? He said, I've tried to have my family involved, and it, it just seems like it's hit and miss, and it's, it's not always working, it's not always successful. And Grandpa Russell said to Tony Holman some wise advice. He said, I tell you what, I give them a lot of responsibility, and I pay them well. I make sure they have incentive. And Tony Holman thanked my grandfather uh, for that little advice, and he applied it to his own life and to his own family in his own business. So the first two turns in the track of discipline, turn one, teach, I do, you watch. Turn two, train, I do, you help. Turn three is test, test. And test is you do I help. Let's turn our Bibles to Proverbs chapter 8, verse 10. Choose my instruction instead of silver, knowledge rather than choice gold. Instruction there is the same Hebrew word for discipline. So we want to choose instruction. We want to choose discipline 
and it compares it to silver or gold. Now, there's this tremendous imagery in Proverbs and in 1 Peter about the refining of gold and silver. And in fact, Peter says that like gold is refined, so our faith is refined to be proved genuine. In the refining process, heat is brought to the metal and the impurities come to the top and the refiner keeps removing the impurities and the biggest, baddest impurities only come up after the most intense heat. And someone has asked, well, how long does the refiner do that? How long does he keep bringing the heat and removing the impurities? And it said, until he sees his reflection in the metal. God is refining each of us through the tests that we have of life. And our impurities come to the top. And he removes those as we confess those. And he begins to see his reflection in the metal. He begins to see his reflection in us. So when we teach and when we train, we need opportunities to fail. That's what a test is. It's an opportunity to fail. So for example, if it was basketball, we would teach a skill. We would train that skill through a drill. And then we'd have a test. We'd have a scrimmage and actually see, does that skill set come up when you have the test? And what it does is it brings those impurities to the top, all the mistakes that we need to remove and refine in order to accomplish four turns around the track of discipline. I remember being at one of the last basketball camps that Al McGuire, coach of the Marquette basketball team, NCAA champions, uh, spoke at. And he was talking about retirement. And he said, you may not understand this, kids, he said, but I'm wondering what's next because I need the opportunity to fail again. I tell you what, I believe I was a ninth grader, and as a ninth grader, I thought, what is he talking about, needing the opportunity to fail? Well, I can look back on that and know that he was looking for a test. He, he needed the test. He needed the competition, the, the opportunity to fail, that impurities might rise to the top, because if there's no such thing as loss, if there's no such thing as failure, then success isn't very sweet. And he relished that opportunity, the opportunity for failure, a test. I remember one of my first tests, again, five years old, going to auctions, and none of these are the same event. Uh, I'm at an auction, and we're going down in a cellar to auction some jars. And my dad said, Mitchell, I'm going to hand you the microphone, and I want you to auction the jars. And I said, no way. I was shy. I was embarrassed, if you can't imagine. Uh, and I, the only way I would do it is if I could hide around the corner with the microphone and the speaker would be where the people are, and I would call bids, and the, my dad would work the ring, and he'd yell the bids back to me. So I remember auctioning all the jars, jars and I'd say, a quarter, now half a dollar, half a dollar, half a dollar, half a dollar, and I probably didn't do it quite that fast, you know? And I think I sold all the jars for around a dollar. Well, that was my dad giving me the first test, the first test to auction something and let the impurities rise to the top, even at five years old. Well, I'll never forget, fast forward about 13 years. And I'm 18 years old. I'm one of the uh, youngest licensed auctioneers in the United States. And um, my dad and I are at an auction, I believe in Cincinnati, Ohio. And up comes Bud Ward's beautiful, unbelievably restored, 1959 Cadillac Eldorado Baritz convertible, red, and you could see yourself in the paint. Bud had the most unbelievable uh, paint jobs and um, my dad said, okay, Mitchell, you're going to sell it. I said, are you sure? He goes, yes. And so I uh, get up and I auction that car. You know, who'll give 100,000? 100,000. 25, 30, 40, 50, 55. You would have been 60,000, 65. Anybody else? 60,000 would have been 65. And I end up selling that Eldorado Brits convertible. Sold $60,000, which at that time was a ton of money for a Cadillac Eldorado Brits convertible. Well, the owner, the seller, Bud Ward, reminded me about a decade later. He said, Mitchell, do you remember when your dad had you sell your first car at an auction in Cincinnati and it was my 59 Cadillac Eldorado Brits convertible? I said, of course I do. He said, I was so upset. 
I thought, Dean, why in the world are you having an 18-year-old sell the best 59 Cadillac Eldorado Baritz convertible in the world? And he said, but I realized something. He said, the people wanted you to be successful and they responded. And he said, and you worked hard and you, you, you tried hard to sell my car. And he said, and it sold for a world record price. He says, Mitchell, for the last 10 years, I've always wanted you to auction my cars. I look back and I see that in the auction business, my dad didn't just do teach, I do you watch. He didn't just do train, I do you help. He put me to the test and he did you do, I help. He was right beside me all the way, helping me auction those cars in those early years. What about you? Are you doing teach, train, and test? It's really important that whether you're a business leader, a mom, or a dad, a coach, that you're doing all four of these turns around the track of discipline. Do you teach? Do you train? Do you test? Turn number four is transform. Our job is to get ourselves out of a job. Transform is you do, I watch, or some say you do, I pray. I want you to hear that again. Our job as parents, our job as leaders, is to get ourselves out of a job, that we disciple those who make disciples. That's what discipline is, to learn. That's what a disciple is, a learner. And we have to have all four, all four of these in order for this to happen. You see, I've noticed how some people uh, you can probably get this picture in your mind with a manager or a coach. Some people want to teach and then transform or correct. So remember in the test, those impurities came to the top. And then we correct or we transform in that fourth turn. But some coaches, some managers, some parents, they talk or they teach and then they correct. They try to transform and they never give the tools, the training and the testing in order to help themselves uh, get themselves out of a job. Our job is to get ourselves out of a job when we are discipling. Too many times as parents we coddle our kids and they haven't built the spiritual muscles and the, and the discipline and the learning that they need in order to be successful in life. And that wreaks havoc on their lives as kids, especially as adults. I'm reminded one time when a friend of mine uh, saw a young child, I'd say about uh, six or seven years old, just going crazy in a bookstore. And he said, Mitchell, this, this kid was out of control. And he said, so I looked around for a parent. And he said, and there was a dad just kind of plopped in a chair. He said, all weary. And uh, he said, I'm getting a little bolder in my older age. He said, so I walked up to the guy and I said, how you doing? He goes, not so well. And he said, I said to the guy, do you have any idea what that looks like at 16? And he said, Mitchell, the guy's eyes went like this and he was in horror, he was in shock to think about it. And he said, I want to give you a book on how to train kids that changed my life and my parenting skills. He said, here's my card. If you want to email me, I'll send it to you for free. Wow. You know, he risked offending the guy but I tell you what, the risk of any parent who loves their kids is that they don't bring teach, train, test, transform, all four turns of discipline to the parenting process. Let's look in Proverbs. Proverbs 13, 18 says, whoever disregards discipline comes to poverty and shame, but whoever heeds correction is honored. Transform or transformation is that correction. And as our children, as our employees, as our teams yield to and heed the correction, prosperity comes their way. I think about a player I coached who had a little trouble with heeding the correction. But then as Proverbs says in another verse, uh, as she would do this, she actually started leading others to respond to the correction. She had an influence on others. And that's what Proverbs tells us, is that um, the one who heeds correction, the one who yields to that instruction, actually leads others to the same. There are three ways that we can bring this correction to our kids' lives, to our team's lives. 
and it's uh, positive reinforcement. We reward the good behavior. Um, negative reinforcement, we remove a positive for negative behavior. And then punishment, we actually microwave consequences when negative behavior occurs. And sometimes that's necessary as a parent. Uh, I've seen too many children who don't experience enough consequences to stop their foolish behavior. And so it multiplies, just as my friend was saying, uh, as the kid gets older, older, and older. And I think the reason for that is we don't equate discipline with love. But it's so interesting that Proverbs, in Proverbs 3, 11, and 12, it, it equates discipline with love. Disciplining your children because you love them. So it's for their own provision and their own protection. And we should communicate that to them, whether we do positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement, or uh, punishment, microwaving those consequences so they feel it enough to not do the negative behavior. I can't help but think, during the last eight years of doing auctions with my dad as business partners, and remember I had heard that voice, uh, in my head, and in many ways, I had assimilated his skill set into mine. And I remember him looking at me one time at the end of an auction after a great run of selling a lot of cars for a lot of money. And he says, Mitchell, I just want you to know something. You are the best in the world at what you do. There's something inside each guy that wants to hear that from his dad. And I've tried to multiply what I learned from my dad to teach train, test, transform into my kids. I remember reading Lily, Mary Maine Simon's young learner's uh, Bible storybook. And we did this. I would read it to her and she would listen or watch. And then I would read it to her and she would help. And then we went through it again where I would, she would read it to me and I would help her with the words she didn't know. And finally we went through that whole storybook a fourth time and she would read it to me and I would watch. My job is to get myself out of a job. And that's the same for you. Your job is to get yourself out of a job. You know, this isn't just true because I say it is. This is the model of Jesus Christ who with his disciples he taught. He did I do you watch. He trained them. He said, I do, you help. He tested them. He sent them out. He says, you do, I help. And then he transformed them. He says, you do, I watch. Apply the four turns of discipline to your life. And you won't just experience discipline and learning. You'll experience Jesus Christ.